appreciate it. Um, so tonight's topic is fifth step, obviously, and the big picture. Um, we'll get to that whenever it's done, man. You can let it roll without sound. It's called, I call it the big picture because I couldn't get the image of the Grand Canyon out of my head as I thought of the fifth step. Because we hear lots of them here, between the four of us and some other people that come in and do them. Um, I want to thank the band for the Beatles. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And, and really, at this point in time, every time I'm asked to speak, I just try to figure out some music that I can get them to play and that they'll agree to. <laughs> so I always appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everyone, tonight. So it's hard to feel too big for my britches after watching anything involving the Grand Canyon. It, I witness the majesty every time I see pictures or I look back and I, I see things on TV or that video, which is obviously not my video. That's Pucifer's Grand Canyon if you're interested in looking it up. Anyone who has seen it from its ledges can attest that it's powerful stuff. It sends imagery to our heart, not just our mind. And the actual Grand Canyon, when I saw it last year, it left me speechless. I say I saw it, but I actually only saw a tiny little bit of it. I went to the edge and I was standing on the edge of forever, literally, like standing there, looking out, and I could still, and you see some pictures that I took when I was there that are flashing by now. I, I saw a bit of it. I could only see so much, right? My eyes could only do so much focusing on that, that majesty that's out there. I only saw a fraction. And even as the photos go by, and that one right there with the, the title screen, um, it's one of my favorites because I, that was the moment where I looked out over the Grand Canyon and I said, I've seen the Grand Canyon. And I was like, okay, I've seen it. And then the argument started it in the back of my brain that said, no, you've only seen a little bit of it. Even though I couldn't, if I looked to the left, I couldn't see that anymore. If I looked a little bit further to the left, I couldn't see it. So I could only see bits and pieces. And the feeling rises up within me now, even just seeing the pictures of just how beautiful it was and just how limited of the big picture I could actually see. And the Grand Canyon is probably, I am probably not the first person to go there and be like, oh my God, right? It's, it's pretty much known for that, I think. Although I might be an original, probably. Probably not. They built restaurants and stuff, so I'm guessing people went there before I did. Although my ego might want me to be convinced that I was the first one, right? I was the first one to feel it like that, right? And some are probably wondering, what does this have to do with the fifth step? Well, I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler alert. Step five is where we let go of our rubbish. That we may see even just a fraction of the big picture that God might have in store for us. That we may briefly know, not in our minds, where we thought we knew before, but in our hearts, that our idea of our purpose and plan might simply be off the mark in some areas. The last few months, I have been hearing consistent themes at every step along the yearly journey that we make here through the 12 steps. Can I have some of that, that water? Okay. Sorry, I'm getting over a cold, and now I have like total dry milk. So through the year, we go through 1 to 2 12. Every month, we do a new step. So there are obviously a few, no matter who is speaking on any given night, in any given month, and from year to year. Some of these concepts and the language that we use described is the same. So we probably hear a similar message, although obviously depending on who's saying it as to how it is uh, given. I'm grateful for that though because I need the steady flow. I need to be bombarded with consistent messaging. I don't know about you, but that's what works for me especially when I'm learning something new. Because for me, learning new information is challenging at the best of times. Because I have all kinds of things that start fighting back against new information. Especially if it's new information that I don't like. If I don't like it, I don't want to hear it. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on when I don't like something, right? Just like you, I'm not speaking for you, but for me, that's how it works. So two of the biggest concepts that we talk about consistently through the months 
are ego deflation or ego in general and denial, right? So ego is basically our brain's way of mediating our reality and allowing us to function day to day. It's necessary to some extent. I'm summarizing, of course, because I'm not an expert on Siggy Freud. But if we did not have an ego of some size and description, we would have difficulty, if we were able to at all, leave the house, go to work, attend university, have friendships, lovers, etc. We'd be pretty limited in our, our human interaction. The trouble is for most of us, well, some of us, that our ego has become a bit of a monster, especially when we first sober up or clean up or come to some realization. If we're not chemically dependent, maybe we simply came to a realization that we needed to live differently, that we needed to find a different way to be. However we came to that, whether it was chemical dependency or not. But the trouble is, this monster has failed to keep its job in proportion, which I know is shocking. The eagle got out of proportion. It's shocking that it would take the reins and it would do its own thing. It's taken things way too seriously and now is running amok. Not only is it convincing us that everything around us is about us and for us and our responsibility to fix, correct and change regardless of the facts, those being that it's not our business, but it has also created a world in us that requires things to go our way in order to be fulfilled and satisfied with life. It tells us that old saying of a bad day equals a bad life. And in order for things to work out, they must go according to plan. Not God's plan, but our plan. That's where ego steps in. And perhaps even right now, as I looked across the room, some of us are probably reacting to that information. Ah, to hell with you, right? <laughs> what do you know about my brain? Probably nothing. So keep on keeping on. I'm not pointing any fingers, except for these ones here. Wait, I can do that, right? Up, yeah, there. <laughs> now some of you will remember that in step one, I provided a brief look into the concept of denial, as it may pertain to conceding to our innermost selves that we are in fact suffering from the malady we identify with, whatever that is, drug addiction, behavioral dependencies, whatever it is. And a quick review, denial is maintained as a psychological defense mechanism, postulated, I use that word on purpose, I wasn't sure I could say it, that's why, again, by our friend, psychoanalyst, Siggy Freud, in which a person is faced with a fact that is too uncomfortable to accept, and we reject it instead, insisting that it is not true, despite its truth, and despite what may be overwhelming evidence to its truth, we still reject it. Now, I don't know if that sounds familiar to you, but it sounds familiar to me. It hits a chord. And this is important to us. It's so important to us that Peter mentioned it last week as number three on our defects of character list, denial. I might have put it a little bit higher, right? But that's because we're different people and he has a right to put it at number three, right? I'm, not, I'm gonna deny that and disagree. I'm kidding, it could go wherever. They're all equally important. It's not a contest of crazy, right? I will get to this in a moment though, because it exists in step five on another level and is directly related as an ego defense mechanism when we engage in the process of giving confession, which is basically what step five is adopted from, the idea of confessing our sins. Obviously we do it in a very specific way, much like they do. I would ask you to close your eyes now. Now I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, but I'm not going to tell you to take your hand off your wallets or your purses, because if you close your eyes, there may be someone in here who's not savory, all right? So remember, my eyes are open, and I'm going to be watching. So close your eyes, but keep your hand on your purse and your wallets. I was going to get a sign for that, but I deleted it from my computer. And I had it from a, it was from a Catholic church in the States. They posted it whenever they do Holy Communion, right? Take your purse with you, they said. Because they're a downtown church as well. That's why I love it here. I wouldn't go anywhere else. So even though your eyes are closed, make sure to be mindful of your surroundings. 
Now think back. What do you remember of the you who walked through the doors of your program, your church, your monastery, synagogue, or wherever you first began your transformation? What were you like? What were your dreams of the future then? Have those dreams adjusted to your life today? Or have we continued to try and arrange life to suit those dreams? If you can remember that moment, perhaps on the precipice of discovering your actual self, because each of us here tonight is there again, we are on the precipice of discovering more of who we are and what we are all about. Now, whether you have done a step five or made confession in some regard, imagine how that vision of you and the world you live in has changed or altered from that day, whether it was years ago, a day ago, weeks or months, are you the same version of yourself today as you were then? Now imagine you are wearing glasses and each resentment, fear, and harm done to other people is a smudge or streak on the glass. What is your vision like when you look through those lenses? What sense of self are you able to identify? How do you look to you? When you close your eyes and all of these experiences flood into your consciousness, are you convinced you can see the big picture as your creator may have intended? And remember that step five is about letting these matters go. One word, one moment, one experience at a time. That we may see more clearly God's picture for us versus that old picture we may have created to suit whatever it was we were doing and however it was we were living. Now I want you to focus on your breathing. Try not to focus on my nasally post-cold voice too much. I want you to take two deep breaths in through your nose if you can, exhaling through your mouth, and on the third breath in, hold the air inside your lungs for the count of four to six, depending on lung capacity. Don't force anything. I can't stress that enough. Don't hold your breath too long. We don't want anyone passing out. And again, exhale through your mouth. And as you feel ready and comfortable, slowly return to your natural breathing process, whatever feels right to you. But as I continue to talk, I really want you to focus on your breath. I want you to feel how the oxygen might circulate through your body as you hold in a breath or two in order to allow more oxygen to flow. Now you can feel free to keep your eyes closed or to open them. But now that you can all imagine having dirty glasses on your face with smudges and streaks on the lenses, <clears throat> you can know what it's like to look through my glasses when I'm too busy to clean them. And anyone who has glasses will totally attest. I've worn these since I was a teenager. Might even have been before that. I can't remember when I first got them. Luckily, there's two people here that can tell me. So even before that, when a smudge, or even one, and it doesn't matter how large or small, one streak across the lens, my vision becomes impaired. If the smudge is off to the side or in the corner of my vision, my eye is naturally drawn to the dirty spot and not the 75 to 80% clean spot in the center. For some reason, I can still see the little smudge, and I actually have one like right there, right? I can see that little smudge because it's dirty. I have to clean them in order to get a new perspective. When my glasses are dirty, I have no problem identifying why I can't see or why I see the smudge instead of the clean 80%. However, when my insides are bottled up from years of living a certain way, in both my actions and those of others, my mind becomes blurred, which in turn blurs my perspective and vision of the world around me. It is hard to see the forest through those proverbial trees, and it is damn near impossible to see even a portion of the big picture. Beyond, of course, the big picture that I have convinced myself is God's picture that I have created 
assuming it's what God wants because it makes me happy. Those of us who've been around for any amount of time know that's not really how it works, right? No one said we were going to be happy all the time. It happens to me, and I'm not sure about you guys. Again, I'm not going to point any fingers. So when we stopped at the Grand Canyon a year ago, I was breathless, speechless, and overwhelmed. I looked out into the vast, seemingly never-ending beauty, and I thought to myself again, this is it. Now, I can't stress it enough because it was a miracle. That's a miracle of, of our Creator. <clears throat> so much like when before I did my first fifth step, I thought to myself, well, I've had therapy, I've had counseling, and I'm so self-aware that I know what to expect once this happens. I had it so planned out that when I went into the office of a minister, I knew exactly what I was going to say and how I was going to wow him and, and shake the foundations of the church with my confession and that it would be ex exactly what I wanted it to be. And it was exactly what I wanted it to be, which was not necessarily what it needed to be. So I had all this prior knowledge, like lots of us do. I'm yet to meet an alcoholic or addict or anyone for that matter who's on a road of self-discovery who doesn't have a pretty good understanding of their problems. However, what I realized from that first fifth step was that it wasn't just my problems that were making me me. It was the other stuff that I couldn't see because of the smudges on my glasses. I didn't know I had assets. I didn't realize what skills were. All I knew was I was dirty. The vision was dirty. So I thought I knew what God wanted for my life based on the 33 years prior to that. I could obviously have no idea. What was, what was your life like before you came to recovery? What was your life like before you did that fifth step or did the steps? I am sure that I would not want to build my life on my first 33. Not all of them. Some of them were great. Absolutely. But I had no idea how unaware I really was until time went by and I started to see that God's plan might be a little different than mine. It might be a little bigger than mine. It might have many different steps, tweaks that were required along the way. So last week, Peter spoke about the process of step four, being thorough and honest inventory looking at resentments, fears, and harms done to others. Now, one of the things I hear often in listening to Fifth Steps is a complete absence of the harms done to others. Now, I don't know if it's like the way things are done in treatment centers or wherever, and that's okay, but oftentimes I have to ask about those. I have to say, well, did you ever steal? Oh yeah, like all the time. Well, why didn't you write it down, right? Did you ever hurt anyone? Well, yeah, all the time. Well, why didn't you write it down? However, the resentment list can take three hours, right? I find that interesting, that a resentment list, because I would, I would, like, get behind that logic. Well, yeah, because they hurt me. I'm going to spend three hours talking about resentments and only harms that are related to those resentments. But everything else is off limits. So then, of course, I would wonder, is that thorough enough, right? But it's not for me to judge, I just listen. But I did find that curious about hearing many of them where that's kind of absent, unless it's related to the resentments. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I lost my spot. It occurred to me just how much clutter was keeping me and is keeping us from seeing and knowing ourselves once we look at the thorough inventory. Imagine looking at it from the person who, we've all known the person or people who have written four steps that take, literally, I've sat and listened, and I know these guys have as well, for multiple hours. And imagine just getting that out, how your vision will be different, how you might be able to see just a little bit more who you really are, who you were intended to be, not who you want it to be, which I know we all want to be rock stars and movie gods, right? Like that's what we want. We want to be internet famous, right? I'm just kidding, we don't. But that's what they want us to want, 
right? I want to have a Porsche, right? I couldn't even fit in a Porsche, really. I mean, I've, have you seen Porsches? Yeah, they're tiny. Maybe one of the bigger ones. But that's not what is me. It's not even me, what I do for a living. It's not, now that's an extension of me, absolutely, of who I hope I am, right? To be of service. But I didn't know who I was. I still don't know who I am. I have a better idea today than I did 12 years ago when I first sobered up, but I don't know perfectly well what God's picture is, right? It's still a little bit of guesswork, a lot of prayer, a lot of meditation, just like it is for most people or for everyone. And I can tell you that when I left that first fifth step, though, from what others have told me of theirs when they left, whether they were talking to me or someone else, that there was slight confusion, and some of us felt a bit lost in the cosmos. I did. I felt like I was wandering with my head up in the, in the space. I felt empty a bit. And I also knew that nothing would ever be the same again. I knew that I could never look at those things the same way I had used to look at them. And it had changed. It had altered my insides. And it wasn't just by accident. It was by as thorough as I could be in that time, that was as thorough as I could be, just like you or anyone else. And that's what I tell people when they come to, to share with me the fifth step. You can only be as thorough as you can be. And if you honestly believe you are, then you're doing the best you can. But that's how I felt. I saw a little bit more of this big picture. And really, in that moment, all I knew of the big picture was that I was wrong. And that was good enough. Because then I could wait around and do some more work, and I didn't have to be so hard on myself. Because I was wrong. All that stuff was wrong. All the different directions I was pushing myself in to be perfect, to be all these different things, I was wrong. Really what God wanted me to be was me. What God wants you to be is you. Whatever the creator is or looks like for you. That's what God wants. Now I want to rewrite the book, right? I do. Like every, most people who came into AA, I wanted to, after the first week, I wanted to rewrite the big book, right? I said, oh, that's terrible, terrible. That English is awful. We need to change this. I'm going to rewrite this. And of course, I was in like studying literature at the time. So I was like, oh, ah, she's going to crack my knuckles and get writing, right? But obviously, it stood the test of time. And I'm not that important. So it didn't, didn't pan out. Nobody listened when I sent my emails. I got no responses. I know it's surprising. I'm pretty articulate. So for the first time in my entire life, I saw beyond all the dirt the grime of my insides, and with a little bit of solidity, was able to comprehend the world around me. Not as it related to me, not in that moment. In that moment, I saw the world free of ego and all the defense mechanisms that it's created and that I've utilized through the years. Now, it only lasted briefly, right? Because like you or anyone anywhere, I'm human and have been given the daily task instead of a one-time task, I've been given a daily task of working through my character defects, facing the ego by utilizing spiritual principles and practices, or those practices which emphasize the principles we discuss regularly, whether in a church or elsewhere. Because it isn't the only place that we discuss principles, right? This is an extension of that, or that is an extension of this. I think the church is around longer, but I'm not sure. A little bit. So step five is paramount in disarming the ego of some of its secret and steady mechanisms of over-existence. It's paramount because some of the things that we go through our head, we don't even realize are defense mechanisms. I don't even realize I'm in denial when I'm in denial. That defines denial. I can't always know. That's why we have sponsors, That's why we have friends right? So that they can say, you know, I think you might be offbeat. I have a friend who actually is pretty diligent about asking me to remind her of that when she gets offbeat. I'm not as diligent at asking her, just to be honest. I don't want to know. <laughs> She's tougher than I am. So we cannot see the big picture until we clean away a chunk of the clutter, which has kept us in denial for so long. 
And of course, we might not see the whole big picture anyway. I don't believe my eyes could handle the whole Grand Canyon all at once. I just don't think I could. Because that little bit of beauty that I was able to see, I cried a little bit. I wasn't going to say that out loud, but I did. I cried a little bit. It's like when I stand in the ocean, and anyone who's been to the ocean or loves the ocean can attest or been to the mountains, right? When I stand in the ocean and I feel that water and I feel earth, I feel God. It's moving, it's bigger, it's, there's no doubt about it. It's like when you walk into a forest and you've, you've seen it from the highway and you walk on the path and you're like, does this ever end? And it doesn't, right? I will die from walking up the mountain long before the mountain ends, right? Oh, hi. <laughs> Are you bringing me a shoe? You want me to have the shoe? You're not going to give me the shoe? It won't fit anyway. So can you imagine how wide open the world might become if we were to engage regularly, regularly in this process of confession and fifth steps? I try to do one every year, but that's, that's my bone. Because a lot of people imagine that doing this process once is enough. And they may be right, but again, I don't agree. Which of course is of no great matter at all. My agreement is neither necessary nor vital for their existence. But I want to be diligent. I know how tricky my ego is. I know how selfish I can be. I know how self-centered I can be. So what I have discovered in myself is that I am prone to those regular trips into ego. And often over things I imagine are free of ego. Because I think I have an understanding beyond what I did before. So what the ego does there is it turns my little bit of understanding into a broad truth. Right? Sometimes we have to dance. So this becomes second nature, much like denial. And we don't always recognize when we are in it. Oh, I may have misplaced a page here. The pages got wet, stand by. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there was a little bit of a water accident up front here. I'm not gonna name any names. I'm not a whistleblower. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> So this leads me into the next concept, a new concept maybe for, for the church, for our 12, 12 steps and 12 months. <clears throat> Keeps us believing that what we know now is exactly what we will need to know in another five or 10 years, or maybe 20. Just as we imagined before we began our individual journeys, that we would be the same people as we always were, we just wouldn't use. Oh, buddy. I don't know about you folks, but I am grateful I am not even close to the person I was when I walked into the rooms almost 12 years ago. And I imagine most people are the same. Grateful they're not the same as they were. Grateful they're not living the same lives as they were. Now this other concept, and there's always more so it seems, right? We keep pulling the layer of the onion back. So why would it be any different for us, right? We'll keep being dig diligent. This is called cognitive dissonance. Now this is the mental stress or discomfort experienced by an individual who holds two or more contradictory beliefs, ideas, or values at the same time, performs an action that is contradictory to one or more of those beliefs, ideas, or values, or is confronted by new information that conflicts with existing beliefs, ideas, or values. Now this becomes second nature, much like denial. We don't always recognize when we are in it. But ask yourself this, have you ever tried to reason with someone new? Have you ever tried to reason with someone who's new in the program and they get their backs up? Has it ever happened to you with a sponsee or someone else and they don't want to like, they don't want to take it? Because they already know, right? Have you ever gotten your back up over new information when that conflicts with your old ideas? I know I have. Or maybe it's not back up, maybe it's like my dad said, it's poofed up. You get all poofed up, chat, wait, poofed? Yeah, poofed. We get all poofed up about it. Now these concepts, they seem to be the underbelly of our beautiful, incredibly fragile, and delightfully resilient core selves. They seem to act out of like instinct, 
at certain points. Because honestly, cognitive dissonance and denial and ego, they're not synonymous with alcoholics and addicts. Those are human things, right? They're very human. We're all prone to it. It's probably a part of our makeup, right? Maybe Siggy wasn't totally wrong, mostly wrong about lots of stuff, but not totally. Now, honestly, when we are running amok at the whim of our ego and our illness, whatever that illness might be, we need to be in denial. We hold on to ego and we die through cognitive dissonance. But do we need to do that now? Do we need to continue that? We have seen a light. It's often blinding us from the end of that dark tunnel. And we may not be able to live in those personal hells any longer because the truth of the matter is, once we see, we cannot unsee. Once we know, we cannot unknow. And isn't it curious that in the beginning of our sobriety of our journeys, we expect ourselves and others to be open to changing. How does that expression go? We have to only change one thing, everything. But yet, as time goes by, we often settle into thinking that we require no further work. Or if we recognize we need more work, we just don't want to do it. Because we've already done it. What's the point? It's like we get poofed up all over again. I can't do it like my dad does. It's poofed up. It starts making more sense what people have said in the past. If we stagnate, we actually go backwards. And I think that is counterproductive to recovery and seems more like regression, unless we want only to be what we always have been. And if that's the case, fair enough. It's hard work. It's hard work to keep going. But they don't call it trudging the road of happy destiny for nothing. And trudging means walking with purpose, right? It appears to me that the big picture is far beyond what I might be able to see in any given moment, just like the whole Grand Canyon. I have to look at it in pieces, just as we have to look at our recovery in steps and portions. Thank you for joining us tonight. It is an honor to speak with you.